So first, uh, welcome to this uh, first online only uh, What's Now Utrecht. Uh, you may have seen the uh, organizational messages or huishoudelijke mededeling, as we would say in the Netherlands. Uh, so the session is recorded. Uh, this is for distribution uh, to you, but also on our What's Now website. Um, I want everyone uh, to, or, and a few recommendations, sorry, for, uh, for running the session smoothly. So if you are dialing in through a company uh, laptop, uh, please turn off your VPN. Um, it's not needed for Teams and it will smoothen your connection. Um, also, I don't see any videos turned on except Boss and me. Uh, so let's keep it that way. You are muted, uh, not because we don't want you asking questions, but we're with a big group and the group will grow. Uh, so this is also to run the session slightly more smooth. Uh, but as Boss said, questions are more than welcome. Uh, put them in the chat, uh, so he will try to incorporate those during his presentation. And at the end of uh, uh, the presentation, we will try and, uh, well, regular uh, Q&A. Uh, just uh, remember to unmute yourself at that, that point. All right, so that's uh, the organizational uh, uh, messages uh, done. Uh, so a warm welcome uh, all to this What's Now. Uh, for some of you, uh, it might be the first What's Now you're joining. Uh, What's Now is an informal event series hosted by the Applied Innovation Exchange of uh, Capgemini, where we consistently feature a remarkable person, uh, a person helping reinvent uh, the field uh, that they're active in, uh, a field that's exploding with innovations or where we strongly believe uh, we should be aware of. Uh, in January, for example, we hosted the uh, UK startup Wasteless. It's a startup that helps uh, um, retailers reduce the waste in the fresh produce section. Um, and today we focus on sports and tech. Um, all the events around the world being cancelled, all the sports events, and I, I, I for sure looked forward to the Tour de France again. Uh, I can imagine we all are looking forward to the events starting up. Um, and we are wondering how are the clubs engaging with their with their fans today, but also before uh, the COVID situation, and how are they using data and technology to refine the, redefine the future of sports? So I'm proud to welcome uh, Bas Snatter uh, from Fan Engagement to our digital stage today. Um, he will share his knowledge and passion about sports, data, and how insights from data can actually help increase your fan engagement. Or, as I think you put very accurately on your LinkedIn profile, boss, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So, with that being said, I'm happy to hand it over to you. So, uh, boss, the stage is yours. Thank you. Great introduction. Thanks uh, a lot for that. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, giving me, say, roughly 50 minutes of your time uh, today. I know I'm sitting uh, between you and the weekend, so uh, I'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. Um, seen a few familiar faces in the chat already, so great that you've all uh, joined in. People that don't know me yet, I will shortly introduce myself um, um, a bit later on. Um, and what I will discuss today actually is uh, how do sports organizations use fan engagement, how do they use data um, to work with the relationship with the fans, um, whereas in very difficult times at the moment as well uh, for football clubs, um, there's usually uh, the months of March, April, May, June are very important transactional months. Uh, for football clubs uh, because these are the times where season tickets get uh, renewed and that's a major revenue stream for football clubs. Now we're all aware um, of the situation at the moment. Uh, obviously we're all uh, online. Usually I give these presentations uh, face to face and I walk into the audience and I, I like to ask questions around as well, uh, make it more relevant for everyone but we'll just uh, uh, work with the ways we have to at the moment. Um, but yeah, in the next uh, 15 minutes, I will tap into three things. What is fan engagement? I'll go for a very brief definement because there's so much um, um, so much noise around the term, so many uh, different interpretations. So I will briefly uh, tap into that. The reason why I'm looking here is because that's my second screen, just uh, so you know. <laughs> 
Well, I'll do it here. Um, then later I will tap into some uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, examples of what clubs are doing now. Fan engagement is very important because, the, as I mentioned, the product that clubs are now selling, uh, yeah, the, 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 the conditions of the product are gone. You don't know if for the next football season, you can even sell seats. Uh, so for football clubs, these are very difficult times. So there are generally two approaches that clubs are doing. Either they're putting the sales online now already or uh, they're waiting. And therefore, engagement is important to, um, yeah, to, to keep the relationship with the fans warm. Um, later on, I will uh, dive into an example on when I used to work for AZ Alkmaar, a small club in the Netherlands, but a very ambitious and very good, um, you know, well-organized club. Uh, I worked there as a marketing intelligence coordinator and in uh, campaigning. And I will, I will give an example on how you can use CRM data and how you can apply that to, uh, to actual campaigning. Obviously, it's very important uh, to, to not only have data, but actually make it useful and do something with it. Only then it, it generates uh, you know, business value. That I will show later on. And uh, as uh, uh, Gwen also said, uh, if you have any questions uh, in, in, yeah, during, the, uh, during the presentation, feel free to drop them in uh, the chat. And if I can, I will try to uh, try, try to connect them to the story. If not, we'll just save them in the end and uh, we'll uh, try to dive into there. There, Then you can also uh, probably do it with, uh, with the voice rather than with the chat. So that, that could be even uh, better if that's what you prefer. Anyway, short introduction. Uh, as you can see here, I worked um, uh, for quite a few years in uh, sports now, though I can still uh, call myself a relatively beginner. Um, I've uh, worked in uh, Eurosport and Fox Sports uh, as an intern uh, during my studies. Uh, so I've always had this sports uh, connection, this media connection. And um, straight after my, uh, my bachelor's degree, I moved to Australia. It was also the teacher saying like, oh, you have to move to Melbourne. It's the Mecca of sports. So I wanted to figure that out. And funnily enough, uh, the previous crisis was still kicking around in the industry, uh, especially in Europe. So no chance for me getting a job in sports because all the budgets were cut, obviously, and then you won't uh, won't easily hire uh, uh, easily uh, as well. And Australia had uh, yeah, a bit of less impact on that. So basically I moved there, uh, worked there for a year, did a couple of very nice uh, things, I had a couple of nice roles at the Australian Open, Melbourne Sports uh, Hub, um, and in uh, the Champions Trophy uh, field hockey tournament, for example. Then I came back uh, with the idea of setting up fan engagement. And that was because in Australia, I worked at a conference which was about achieving bigger crowds. And uh, that conference was all about uh, providing fans the best experience and uh, uh, understanding what fans think of your match, uh, match day experience and, and how to... How to uh, uh, to communicate to them. It was a very strange uh, setting because back in 2012, uh, especially in Europe and uh, definitely in the Netherlands, everyone was always talking about sponsors and getting the right hospitality packages and making sure that the sponsors are fine. But me, as a, as a season ticket holder of Ajax myself, I was also always slightly frustrated about that, thinking, hey, I, I study sports marketing, I'm a sports fan myself, but still, for some reason, I have no role in the whole uh, domain of sports marketing. Flash forward to that uh, conference, there it was. Uh, Manchester City was talking about how they measured fan, uh, fan engagement, Mark Bradley, now I would call him uh, the god of fan engagement, uh, British guy. Uh, uh, giving presentations on how, how to connect with fans. There was Seattle Sounders, etc. So there were a lot of very good sports entities explaining that they do work with fans. So for me, the whole paradigm changed there. It was, hey, sports marketing is not hospitality. It's also about fans. And apparently there are subdomains. Um, summarizing all that, that's what I uh, focused on because it, it comes from the heart, not because it was... Uh, a good uh, business uh, thing to do because no one was talking about fan engagement. Now, luckily, now uh, nowadays it's becoming more and more, uh, more and more important. So that's that's good for me. But it it, it uh, I stepped uh, into that uh, world uh, yeah, in 2012 and have always been active in that. 
Now, um, as you see, I've, I've went back to university, I've done a master's degree at, uh, in Belgium, uh, done some studies uh, next to it. But most importantly, I would, uh, li- uh, would highlight that I've worked at AZ Alkbar, a football club in, uh, for the international, uh, international Zero football club in, um, uh, in North Holland region. Uh, we always say, or I always say, it's the best of the rest. You have Ajax, PSV and Feyenoord, and then they can't only play each other. They do need to play someone else, and that's uh, their best of uh, those. In fact, they're second in the league in the Netherlands now. And uh, nobody knows what's going to happen for this season, but at least they're, they're, they're sportively very interesting. Um, business-wise, they were still a bit behind. And it was back in 2016, uh, there was a lot of work that still had to be done uh, regarding marketing and making marketing smarter. So that's what this story is also about. It's a lot about how to use data to measure uh, your marketing uh, marketing efforts uh, better and to, to be smarter with the communication with the fans. Very big introduction, actually. I uh, didn't want to spend so much time on it. Um, now let's see if my slide deck continues. There you go. If you want to read some more about uh, later on about the work that I've done at AZ, you can uh, find some sources uh, there. But uh, I will uh, first introduce a bit what is fan engagement about. We're going the other way. There. Because fan engagement is such a term that is... Um, fluid it keeps moving around back in 2012 13 it was a lot about social media then it moved very much into the match day uh, experience and now it's becoming sort of a hybrid between social media uh, off-site uh, off-site off match day uh, experiences and then you have the on-site on match day experiences um, we'll dive uh, into that a bit but I always like to relate back to academic uh, uh, work because the, those are mostly the most founded uh, opinions. And there's a, there's an article that says here very clearly, a sports consumer extra role behaviors in non-transactional exchanges to benefit his or her favorite sports team, teams management, and other fans. Some fascinating aspects in here already, and other fans. So there's a sort of a uh, C2C relationship uh, and that's, of course, in the sports context, that that's, makes the sports uh, industry so much more unique than many other industries. Um, there's, no, there's only a very few um, amount of brands in a non-entertainment uh, context that have um, C2C communications. Apple does, uh, does have, a, have that. Uh, Starbucks has that uh, at some point. IKEA, for example, doesn't have that have it uh, as much, um, and that's something that marketeers, of course, try to facilitate. They try to facilitate with um, user-generated content to get conversations between C to C going. Where in the sports context, that happens naturally. Fans talk to each other and they rip on each other if you support the wrong team. Makes sense. Um, as you can see here, there's a lot of extra role behavior uh, involved. So there's there's a lot of out, output of identity. Uh, I want to wear uh, my jersey because I, I can show others that which team I support. And with that, uh, subconsciously, of course, the set of values that you represent in that, uh, in that sense as well. And there's a non-transactional exchanges part. And that's very important as well because fan engagement is a lot about relationship building. It's social science, it's communications where transactions can come from that, but that's the secondary aspect of it. So if you have um, uh, fans want to connect with you because you you represent certain values, you provide them input for for social life, you provide them input for communications uh, with with their friends. And because of that, fans want to buy a t-shirt or go to a game. So there's, there's a specific order in that, in my interpretation. Uh, and if we, I will, I will tap into this one as well. Uh, and you can see, you can see that a bit here. There's there's a lot of introvert uh, fan behavior and extrovert fan behavior. So there's a lot of uh, activities that uh, fans get involved in externally, like going to games, uh, which is then a season ticket is a very transactional aspect. Though there's also non-transactional uh, uh, extrovert behavior, which is going to, uh, to, to your friend's house to watch a game together or going to uh, public viewing events. Uh, for example, um, 
there's a lot of uh, things uh, involved. Now, there's always this debate, which which uh, I, I always uh, fear a bit. Is are fans that important? Because we uh, the sports industry is something that is very much driven on sponsorship money, and uh, not uh, not occasionally I've had conversations uh, with people saying, why would we invest in fans? Uh, a lot of work and money in fans to get the 300,000 euros where that's the same value of one extra sponsor. And yes, that is true on short term, though sponsors are the ones that will come and go. Sponsors are the ones that will not remain if there are hard financial times coming up, which we are now. So this is a great example. Fans are the ones that will not let you go. It's the same as with um, uh, with friends. Sometimes you call them up to say to to check up on them, see how they're doing. Not because then I get a better gift for my birthday, uh, which is a month later, but just because you invest in the relationship and your your that's that's the relationship you work on. Then from that comes more things. So it's it's a lot of fan engagement is a lot about how to, how do you uh, design your social life as well and how do you work on that and uh, the other aspect is as soon as you have the connections you need to maintain them and you need to work on them or else they fade away and that's that's no different with uh, with the connection between fans and a football club now how important are fans financially i would say very important and i will explain you why this is uh, the next couple of slides are coming from the uefa benchmark uh, and what you can see here is that um, the increase of uh, attendance uh, across Europe. You see there's a, there's a slight decrease happening in, in the Netherlands and in Belgium and in the Scandinavian countries. And in Russia, there's a massive increase of attendance happening in, in Greece as well. And is this important? Yes, because for, for, from a financial uh, point of view, uh, there is definitely a, uh, a big aspect of, uh, of fans uh, that uh, are connected to the revenues that a club makes. We all know that England, uh, in England, there's a lot of, um, they have massive TV contracts and their income is so high compared to, to all the other uh, leagues. And the, the other four of the big five, they also make a lot of money from that. But there's a difference. If you can see is that uh, on this slide is that uh, on the first part, you see that 53% of the uh, of the, the revenues from the Premier League comes from domestic TV rights. And that's a massive, um, it's a massive amount. I think last time I checked, it was 28 and a half million pounds that each club in the Premier League gets uh, just from the TV rights. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating amount of, uh, amount of money. In the Netherlands, it's it far different. we only have 15%. There's one um, one uh, participant that has a speaker on, I think, still. So I'd like to invite I, uh, you to. I just muted him, uh, boss. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, but what you can see here is that the the revenues from fans, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, is 29%, where in England it's only 13% of your total income. So it makes sense that for the Netherlands. It's far more impactful to say, hey, if the fans are not going to come to the stadium, we will lose a lot of revenue. So from a business perspective, fan engagement is relevant as well. And it's the same with Belgium. But in Scotland, for example, it's massive. Uh, and still in the other uh, countries, here you see the big, uh, the big five, obviously, they have less focus on that. doesn't mean they don't do that well or that they don't have any focus on that. It just means that they have a different spread of the of the revenue uh, streams and oh, this we already had and you see that there's a there's a, a connection between here as well so the netherlands has uh, uh has 29 percent of its revenues coming from uh, ticketing but it's going down so that could raise some flags saying, hey, uh, Dutch uh, teams, we need to do something. Why are those fans uh, leaving? Why are they not uh, staying or coming to the stadium more often? Uh, you can see that the big five, England, Germany, France, Spain, and Italy, they're all sort of the same. So they do, they're definitely doing that part well. Um, but yeah, it keeps, it, it 
there's there's a lot of different uh, differentiation in uh, in the uh, in the countries. And my uh, interpretation is that that comes also from focus. How much focus do we put uh, on those um, yeah, on the fans? Luckily, there's a lot of a uh, lot of work being done by UEFA uh, with UEFA Grow as well. It helps a lot on now also on league uh, attendances. So that's that's at least a good point. Here you see something else. Uh, this is the distribution of TV rights in national uh, leagues. Um, I will, you know what? For time-wise, I will skip this one. Let's go to a bit more fan engagement model. What you see here is something that Jeff Wilson and David Fowler have created back in 2016. And this is sort of a very rough overview on what is fan engagement as well. You see here some very inter interesting aspects. You see uh, on the horizontal axis, you see uh, on-site and off-site. Makes sense. You have match days, you have non-match days. Um, uh, but do you have activities on the ground or do you have activities uh, somewhere else? Uh, um, that, that happens and you have the match days and non-match days, as I said, on the y-axis. And you can combine those as well. So, for example, if you have uh, on-site match day uh, experience, then that means that uh, the fans that come to the stadium, you need to maybe uh, work on a pre-match day program, a halftime program, uh, and also, um, give me one second. Uh, and also, you see that uh, there's, there's uh, you also have the match day, but offside. So if you have, uh, let me give you an example, there's the Euro 2020, which was supposed to happen uh, this summer, uh, but it's now, of course, going to be next summer. But you have uh, the uh, experiences at the stadium, but there's also public viewing in other parts of the uh, other parts of the city. So that's a very good example of match day, but off-site. There's also aspects of non-match day on-site. Uh, let me give you an example. Everton knows that there's in the city of Liverpool there's a lot of uh, elderly, and they. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of elderly people, there's loneliness. So what they do as a very social club, they say, you know what? Um, we have the stadium on non match days as well. Let's facilitate uh, small community organizations to come to the stadium. For example, a local bridge club for the elderly, which then come to the stadium, they have their social interaction going, uh, and they, they, uh, there's in, at the same time, you engage with them, you have the connection uh, between that group that visits the stadium and the club growing stronger. So that's a good example for that. Non-match day, off-site uh, is also um, things that I've seen uh, from AZ Alkmaar or AZ Milan, for example, where they have season ticket holders uh, and they, they provide them now with gift boxes with uh, sanitary products and they give them a jersey. So those are very great examples where they bring those boxes uh, to the houses of uh, of the fans. Now, in Corona times, obviously, all we have is the off-site, and this is going to be the, the big challenge. Uh, what do we do if we have uh, stadiums, but we cannot fill them? We need to keep fans engaged because we need them, or we want them to come back uh, to the stadium at some point. But what do we do until then? There are some examples here. Offsite, non-match day, is stay connected with the fans. So here's an example of Leighton Orient. For example, they've, they've created this uh, FIFA Ultimate Quarantine. Uh, nice uh, play of words there as well. But they've, basically they've created this, this uh, football um, uh, competition via, uh, via FIFA, uh, twin, uh, FIFA 20 uh, for clubs to, uh, to compete with each other. There's also other examples. There's Juventus, uh, who has a OTT platform, uh, so an over-the-top uh, platform where they uh, they broadcast their own uh, their own content, and they say, you know what, Italy, uh, for this month, uh, because we need to stay home, and this was still in the beginning of the the quarantine uh, period, they said we give this free or for free uh, away for everyone, uh, just to to. Um, yeah, to keep yourself entertained while you're uh, waiting at home uh, in quarantine. Or there's this one where you have, uh, there's uh, obviously a lot of archive content that's being uh, uh, being uh, broadcasted now. Uh, and you see that here, uh, see Grenoble Rugby uh, says uh, we're going to broadcast some of the most epic games of the last, uh, of the last uh, few years uh, on our Facebook page. 
Oh, dus FC Utrecht, who says, hey, here's, uh, here's a uh, small drawing uh, contest uh, for the smaller fans. So there are so many uh, examples uh, happening at the moment. La Liga, also a great example. Uh, having a, la, the sort of uh, La Liga fest has happened uh, uh, 28th of March, uh, this was. And they had a uh, sort of a, a sort of an event where music and sports came together and they were raising money. Fantastic. Uh, football shirt challenge. So this is again another example of C2C communication uh, where uh, fans actually... Uh, uh, yeah, wear their wear their jerseys on uh, on work days, sitting at home, anyways. So, um, and here's another example: match days offside. So there's a lot of archive content that's being uh, being dusted off. And this is an example of Ajax that has broadcasted one of their most epic games. Uh, when I was still season ticket holder, so this is the one that I uh, I remember uh, close to heart as well. Um, but yeah, this is this was a great game that they uh, they broadcasted. Uh, but here you see as well, they there is a club Watford that said, you know what, if the real game is not happening, we'll just play it on FIFA and we'll broadcast that. So at least there's something to watch. Um, it's going to be interesting now because there's of course uh, there's going to be uh, some leagues that are discussing to start up again. Uh, I believe that the German league is uh, is at least at the point of discussing. I'm not sure how far they are, uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure the media is uh, is all over that. La Liga has said, okay, we're going to start over. Uh, we're going to start this up again uh, behind closed doors. No date yet, but at least we'll have something to go on again. So get it back into that uh, uh, general uh, supporter routine. So that was uh, that was the uh, these were some examples of the Corona uh, times. I will now um, dive a bit more into uh, data and fan engagement. How do you, for example, apply CRM data to a season ticket uh, campaign? This is an example which I will share with you uh, when I was still working at uh, at AZ. Um, there was a, was a uh, problem at the club. There was a, quite a decline in, uh, in uh, seat ticket holders and uh, no one really understood why that was. And of course, uh, being from a marketing background, everyone had an opinion, oh, it's this, it's not the experience is great, it's, it's that. Many, uh, many uh, opinions, but as my uh, LinkedIn says as well, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So um, uh, when I arrived there, we actually started to... Uh, um, before uh, we, we started uh, in 2016 with getting a uh, data partner on board, long process, we chose for two circles and they helped us to structure the data and to understand what was happening. So we had uh, so many insights from ticketing data, for example. And from that, we could understand, okay, can we identify people that had a, had a, a season ticket in the season 15-16, uh, but not in 16-17 anymore? How many years did they had a season ticket before that? Or uh, are there any other uh, uh, numbers that we could uh, get from that? And with a season ticket campaign, it's very easy. You call that retention. Uh, and that's that happens in media as well. That happens also with Netflix. How many months are you in a subscription? That happens in the telco industry. Loyalty programs for HEMA, for example. So there's, there's a lot of retention is a very important number. Uh, rule of thumb in marketing is that uh, acquisition of, of new uh, new customers are seven times higher than re retaining current ones. So therefore, also in a membership context here, very important to understand that. And we started to notice, hey, the retention is not is, is 77, 78. Is that high or not? Well, luckily, we could benchmark it and it appear, appeared that that was not high at all. Uh, so we started to understand, okay, is there a scale? Yes, there was a scale. So we were in an unwell situation for many years uh, and uh, the projected uh, retention was 81%. So again, there was, how, how, what, what can be changed? What, what can the club do to, uh, to change that? And we went in two directions. One of them was qualitative research and the other one was quantitative research. Quantitative will dive uh, dive into a lot. First, uh, qualitative research. There was a lot of uh, things that we could uh, discover from the fans. Why are they season ticket holder? What do they 
wish to find at the stadium? Is it football? Is it social connections? Is it maintaining uh, their relationships uh, with their uh, uh, with their the, the ones they go to? Whatever. So we we wrote out a very uh, big research, and we uh, we started to find out a few things. For example, um, we plotted out. We we asked a lot of aspects on how important is for you. Um, the, the the food and beverage quality quite important. Do you how high do you rate it? And because we asked that for for every aspect, we were able to plot this around. And I just noticed this is in Dutch, so I will guide you through it a bit. Um, on the bottom left, you see there's one dot which is uh, entertainment during half time. So we asked how uh, how high do you value it? It was just below six. But if you then ask, do you find it important? Not really. Then this is a very strong indicator that uh, rather than saying, hey, fans don't find it uh, very good, let's start to improve it. If they don't care and you have limited resources, uh, in this case, uh, human resources, it might be something to consider to uh, put those human resources on different aspects. Um, here's another one. There's a uh, uh, one that's far more important. It's over seven, but the valuation is six, and that's price of uh, the price of food and beverages. Hey, that's interesting. So if we can uh, improve the fan experience, match days on site, uh, what can we do? We can see if we can either up the quality of uh, food and beverage or lower the prices. Uh, you kind of understand if you're also a bit of a commercial uh, business uh, where this was going. So. We, this helped us as a marketing uh, department, where research is obviously a big part of, your, uh, of your, your work, to start the conversation with the food and beverage manager. Hey, is there something that we can do to get that valuation up? Because fans find it important, though they don't think it's good yet. And this gave us some good directions already. Uh, it also gives you uh, indications on what are your USPs. For example, there was here, uh, this dot is uh, pitch view. So uh, it has a high valuation, but also they find it very important. Hey, that's great. So pitch view, let's, uh, let's remember that and stick that into, uh, into our strategy. The other one as well, uh, this was uh, the quality of play. Uh, AZ is known in the Netherlands for be, uh, playing very attractive football. Um, and that's uh, definitely something that fans uh, identified uh, as well. Yes, this is very important. Uh, and yes, we, we uh, find that it's, it's very good as well. So, hey, another um, uh, USP. And using these aspects, um, taking these aspects, we put those into the communication strategy. Um, so, uh, we'll, we'll park this for now, but it will come back later. Um, Here's the CRM part, which I was talking about. So historical analysis. We dived into the data, again, in, in collaboration with our uh, data partner, we dived into the data and uh, to understand which factors were important uh, for uh, retention. In this case, uh, we looked at uh, the uh, amount of matches uh, visited with your membership. So if you have access to 17 games, do you actually go to all those games or not? Or do you maybe go to 14? That means that you're getting into a uh, risky uh, area because the average attention, you see here the, the, the thin red dotted line was 78%. You can see that there was a uh, variation around uh, the amount of uh, people that went, uh, that either consumed all of their uh, all of their product uh, access or few, uh, fewer of that. That was one of the um, that was one of the indicators that that was a predicting um, a variable. I see a question by Nick. How was the, all this historical data collected? It was already in the ticketing system. So this was just making use of data that was already available. Um, the club used the same ticketing system for many years and therefore without uh, realizing it themselves, they already generated all this data. So that could be uh, an answer to your question. If not, let's uh, continue after the presentation. Uh, the age was also an important variable. So we checked, okay, uh, how are all age groups um, the same? 
when it comes to renewing their season ticket. And we saw that that was not the case. So younger fans were less likely to renew their season ticket uh, than older fans. Okay, interesting. We'll park that also as a, a predicting variable. And the same variation was there with block. So, for example, the hardcore uh, fans uh, were actually less likely to renew, which was interesting. But if we cross that with the age, we saw that there was a slow, uh, uh, very significantly lower age sitting on that section as well. So that made sense for us. So in that way, we tried to combine the data a bit to understand it. Because just getting these insights, you would go roughly on that. Okay, um, if you would just follow the data insights, you would get to a unlogical uh, model. Uh, we were actually able to, to just by um, understanding who sits on that section, we were able to explain this smaller, uh, yeah, smaller gap, for example. There was also in section J, the family section, uh, there was uh, lower retention. That, and that was because the family section was sitting next to the away section. That uh, makes sense. There's, there's slightly more uh, testosterone in the away section than in the family section. So uh, that, that could explain that they're, they're, they may have felt uh, less uh, safe, for example. And you could also see that, uh, I could have plotted this slightly better, but you can see that uh, the longer uh, someone has a season ticket, the more likely they are there to stay. And that makes, makes a lot of sense as well, because as soon as you have a habit, uh, that, that comes with every product or every service that you, uh, that you use, as soon as there's a habit involved, then you are more likely to keep that aboard. That is why uh, organizations put so much effort on onboarding programs and getting you through those first 100 days. It's something we do uh, at Media House as well. As soon as you get a, um, a newspaper subscription for the Telegraaf, uh, for uh, Noordons Dagblad or any other of our labels, we want to get your habit going. So we definitely uh, clear out, okay, this is what you this is what you purchased. Uh, here's, this is how you download the app. This is how you... Uh, um, how you can read the, the newspaper in a digital form, for example. So it's a very interesting book I have here as well, The Power of Habit. Definitely a recommendation uh, to dive uh, into this. I see another question uh, from a student at the uh, University of Aalborg, I think. I will come back to you later. Um, so combining all these uh, variables together, we were able to create a retention score. And in this case, you could see that we were able to, to put uh, the fans in the same jars that we identified before. So we were able to say, okay, 6,000 fans uh, are actually raising so many green flags, they're very likely to renew. Great. Do we need to put marketing effort into them? Unlikely, because they might uh, already renew anyways. The red ones hospitalized, under 60, so many red flags. Should we put a lot of marketing effort uh, into them? Very unlikely that they will uh, change their uh, mind. So maybe also not. So we decided to focus on this middle group, the ones that could still be uh, persuaded uh, into uh, renewing their season ticket, also by understanding what was the factor that they didn't, uh, why they are scoring in that group. Now, if you have all those insights, of course, you need to uh, transfer that into a communications plan. We need to sell season tickets. So what is, the, what is the thing that we need to do? You need to understand better when to communicate what. Uh, and this is how we structured the campaign. So back in February, we already did the season ticket uh, analysis. Uh, and this is just for the, for the record, this example can be applied to every football club. Uh, this is not an example just from, from this club and you can only use it in this, this, this scenario. This is definitely something you can do uh, everywhere. Um, so you can see roughly a planning and there's always this, this, there's these two brackets. There's retention uh, time and there's the acquisition time. And it can overlap a bit at the end, but you always, uh, again, if you're a small football club, um, have focus on, on one aspect rather than the other. And then they, uh, since they follow up, uh, it makes uh, makes more sense as well. And I'll explain why. You can see here uh, plotted the uh, the time that uh, we started with the campaign. So here, for example, 1819, it started just before uh, uh, 7 of April, quite late. 
and you can see that the ending was uh, not as high. Uh, so I saw a correlation at some point as well, where here, 15-16 season started on the 24th of March, peaks up uh, above there as well. And it, if you think about it again, this is a data insight, but as soon as you uh, think about it, it makes sense, because if you start a campaign uh, earlier, it means there are still more matches in the previous season that you meet your season tickets. Uh, your season ticket holders. Therefore, um, you can communicate on moments when they all still come together, which is matches of the current season. So that's what we did. Uh, we started to do that as well. We, st we opened a, uh, we started with the campaign 5th of April. Um, that made in that uh, programming uh, for the rest of the season, that made a lot of sense. So we still had quite some games uh, connected. To, uh, uh, still had three games into the into the planning. So let's get back to those, uh, those slightly uh, fan engagement elements. Uh, what you can see here is that uh, we set up the campaign and we said, okay, I set I set in full attack. Remember that uh, the fans said in the survey we like uh, the style of play from AZ. So this was one of the USBs we uh, incorporated directly into the into the campaign. Then, fan engagement elements. Hey, uh, if you renew early, we will give you some uh, extras. So we wanted the fans to, to, uh, renew, uh, to renew sooner, which is for a ca from a cash flow, uh, cash flow perspective for a football club also, of course, relevant. Um, early renewers. If you renew between now and a week, we will uh, uh, select a couple of people that get access to the press conference to one of the, one of the home games. If you renew between now and one and two weeks, you will uh, um, you might win a uh, signed home jersey. And we had player presentation and we had a tour in the in the academy. And in that way, we had some exclusives uh, to give away, which for the clubs cost nothing because you have access uh, to all of those uh, yourself already. But for fans, those are in incredible experiences to have. And uh, important as well we we closed off uh, the communication so as soon as someone had renewed we actually sent them an email hey great that you're there again uh, thank you for renewing something i've always learned from my mom if you get something you say thank you uh, but in 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 for, for some reason in customer uh, journeys that doesn't always help uh, didn't always ha happen and yet um, i had two two days ago i ordered a new tv from cool blue and it got great Follow up on hey these these are the ways how you can uh, have the right set right settings for your TV. This is uh, thank you for pro choosing us uh, to purchase your TV for example. So they they are a good example of doing that as well. Um, then the, we uh, we chose oh let me no oh, going the wrong way. Another aspect we saw that the young people uh, didn't renew. Um, uh, that easily as older people remember. So we dived into the into the the pricing strategy, and we saw actually that uh, fans, uh, if they turned 18, they had to pay from 150. Uh, all of a sudden, they had to pay 250 euros. What happens if you're 18? You probably go to university. You probably uh, go um, to you move uh, to one of the bigger cities, uh, uh, university cities, and you're gonna start living there. You want to drink uh, drink beer? You want to go to the bars? Uh, what for that you need money, and so one of the first things that you uh, will probably uh, cut out of your life is your season ticket. To get back to that later, but um, obviously we didn't want that, so we decided uh, let's take the financial element slightly out of that. So rather than from going from 150 to 250. You guys take a bit, we guys take a bit. So um, now renewing, if you were 19 to 24, uh, it would cost you 200 euros rather than 250. So there was also, we adjusted the price strategy for that a bit. Here's another element from, from the research saying, hey, we, we really like uh, the pitch view. We're so close on the pitch, is what fans said. So we use that for the content. This was for the fans that were sitting on this specific stand. We showed them this photo. Fans sitting on the other uh, on the other side of the stadium, they got a photo of similar, but with a player on that side of the pitch, showing them, hey, this is actually something that you uh, uh, that you like. 
subconsciously. Obviously, we didn't communicate it that way, but uh, it, this is something that they, they uh, identified as a uh, unique aspect. Nope, wrong way. There we go. Something else that we did uh, is uh, before the last game of the season, um, we had uh, uh, still uh, we still had some renewals to go. So what we did is that we created this flyer, and this is a good piece of, of uh, using data for offline communications. We put the flyer in every seat that was not renewed yet, um, and there was a was a small text by the captain at the time, who still saying, "Hey, uh, fan, great that you were there this season. Uh, we've had some fantastic results. We couldn't have done this without you." Now. We would like to see you here again next year. Uh, so please uh, stay with us and uh, don't forget to renew your season ticket. This was such a good, um, this was such a success is that 11% of all the renewers happened in the four days after this. And we also saw from the point of communication to the, the, the regular downtime of transaction again was four days where an email only has an attention span of around 24 hours. So this was for us very good evidence that offline communication still is very effective because um, if you get this flyer, you bring it home, you chuck it on the, on the kitchen table, for example, and it, it is a recurring piece of communication that you see over and over until you renew or you throw it away. An email, you see, swipe to the left, it's gone. So this was for us a very important aspect as well. And I hope this, uh, this GIF, it does play a bit, as you can see, we fired uh, only the seats that were not renewed yet. It was a lot of work. Luckily, uh, the support of Federation helped us with that. Uh, so, great story, but for another time. Um, they helped us to flyer those seats. Something else that we did. Um, a week later, we sent out an email saying, okay, uh, most, of, most of the times a week after the, the finishing the season, uh, you you have um, uh, the broadcaster creating a year in review um, our episode on TV, for example. What we did is that we actually used the data for fan engagement. So we used the data in an email to the fans. In this example, you see um, there's a nice GIF on the top, and this is your season in review, where the text says you've been uh, this season you've been 17 times uh, to your own seat on. Your seat, your seat, or your your stand from the band tribune. Uh, you've traveled there. That means that you have seen 90 minutes times the amount of games that someone has uh, has uh, been to. 1530 uh, minutes of attacking football from your seat on section X1 in this example, meaning you're on top of the 10% the most loyal fans. Obviously, we did that not for the fans that. Uh, uh, that didn't go many games, or else there would be lower 10%. Uh, then you just leave that part out. It's dynamic communication. But for the top ones, you want to promote them a bit, and you want to give them the extra feel. Same thing that we did this season. You've seen of the 72 goals uh, at home games, you've seen 41. And the entire email was filled with these kind of uh, snippets of the data. And this helped to communicate uh, in a very nice way just a, a general act of kindness. Now, at the bottom of the email, we did have a call to action, but only visible to the fans that had not renewed yet, uh, saying, hey, make sure that you're there again next season. Fans that had renewed already did receive that email, because, again, it's part of relationship building, but they didn't see the button. So it was just an act of kindness. And emailing in that kind of, in that kind of way helps to keep the communication going. And here you see some other examples of... Um, we need, uh, of the, uh, the the last week of, of the renewals. And here also you see, again, you see uh, very, uh, very well, you see very, uh, player interaction, which was for that section, uh, one of the, the uh, one of the most important factors. And you can see some, some moving images. We A-B tested that as well, and it worked uh, better. Last day, uh, we send, a, send an SMS. Hey, don't forget to renew. Always a very effective uh, channel. We, the, uh, the club had been doing that for years and it was always very effective. And as you can see, uh, retention actually went up. The amount of uh, season ticket holders went up. And uh, in, in fact, uh, around August, uh, they went over 9,000. Uh, 
And that means that because we use data, we communicate it to the right fans at the right time via the right channel with the right message and the right content. We communicated that all at the same time, or we combined that into a good mix. Uh, and we had segments, so we had uh, segmentations based on uh, on the stance, and a year later we had them actually based on a lot of different behavioral factors. Uh, you could see that we increased retention from 78% to 95%, which was uh, one of the worst kids in class, uh, all of a sudden to, to going one of the best kids in class. So obviously that was fantastic. Now. A lot of effort has been put into this by marketing, by ticketing, by communication uh, department. They all had to collaborate together using data as input uh, for the campaign. It was a very bold move by the club. Uh, so it was, I was very happy to be, uh, be part of that, of course, and to, to uh, be uh, yeah, project leading this. Uh, but still, it was a very uh, was a very bold move, and I'm still very thankful for that because it's a very uh, it, it showed that data can give you the right insights that you need to improve your your um, you know, your business performance. So these were the results. Uh, we stopped the traditional decline, and ambition was always to hopefully not as many fans will walk away. Now, in fact, uh, 1,400 uh, season tickets got sold. Um, on top of that in the acquisition uh, campaign. So therefore we reached over 9,000. And uh, a good learning was here also that uh, using data for offline communication is possible as long as you can, uh, you're creative uh, to find the right connections. Uh, this I will skip because we're in, uh, we're already on the Friday, uh, Friday afternoon uh, drinks uh, session. But I, will, I do want to show you this. Oh, a bit too far. I also have a closing off slide uh, with some readings. That's this one. What we did is using data uh, for marketing uh, efforts. And uh, there are a couple, of, uh, a couple of good reads that I would recommend if you think this was interesting and you want to wanna explore this further. One of them is Winning with Data. Uh, it's written by Fiona Green. Uh, she runs a... Uh, uh, yeah, she, she runs a CRM uh, consultancy. I also have a chapter in there uh, about AZ on um, the topic of uh, data governance and GDPR. Very sexy uh, topic and always an icebreaker. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, very, it's a very interesting book. Uh, it's going to be renewed. Uh, there's going to be a second edition uh, coming up soon as well. So fascinating. Uh, a lot of great cases. There's a very academic book, but very interesting about sports consumer behavior. Uh, also a very uh, creative title, sports consumer behavior. Um, it's very it's very useful and you actually see a lot of uh, a lot of the, the academic work around marketing uh, being combined into sports context. Third one, the relationship economy. Very important um, message comes from that. We're not working with um, transactional moments. We're working with a relationship. You, you are an institute and you have customers and every account manager, for example, knows that you need to um, uh, create a relationship with your accounts because from that you work into uh, generating new transactional moments. That is no different with fans or with customers. Uh, it's something we do in, uh, that happens in media. It's something that uh, happens in sports. Netflix does it. They try to keep you connected, keep you engaged, uh, also with, um, uh, with the power of habit. As I said, if you're in that relationship, you're more likely to convert to a next stage. And that's, uh, that's something the, the, that book uh, communicates uh, a lot about as well. There's also a lot of econometrics about pricing uh, models, et cetera. But it's a, very, it's a fascinating read. Also, I would uh, definitely recommend that one. And that does bring me to the end of the presentation. Uh, now I will like to open up the floor, or if uh, Gwen would like to say something, then. Uh, yes, yes. So um, that will give everyone a bit of time to go unmute if they have questions. Uh, you can also type them in the in the chat box uh, as Boss addressed them today. Um, what I love to see in your presentation was Boss at one point in the AZ case where. You know, they used online data for the offline communication with the pamphlets mm -hmm. on the seats. Um, but also, 
how they use the offline data at the end of the season, you know, this is how many times you've been. Yeah. And my, my background is originally retail, and that's something I see in the retail industry. We, we're still looking into how can we use the offline data from our stores to actually improve our communications online and make it personalized. Yeah. Uh, and seeing the increases, you know, the going from the bad, uh, the, the worst kid in the class to the best uh, is remarkable to see. Yeah, I think there's there's uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities that can still be explored uh, to yeah to dive more more into this. This was just an example that we did. We borrowed it also from Brighton, who had done that the year before. Um, but there's always I always like to make the crossovers with different industries. Uh, there's so much happening when you go to uh, when you go to to the music events, for example. The O2 Arena has an incredible customer journeys. Uh, that onboards you before you go to an actual uh, concert and then has an afterflow as well on the photos, uh, video after, and this is a recommendation we would give you for a next concert. So there's still so much to do uh, in that sphere. Um, but yeah, that's what makes this field so exciting. Yeah, really great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Buzz. Um, no I haven't seen any new questions in the chat. So I'm going to leave it open a few minutes for people uh, to unmute if there are questions. Um, there was one in the chat, uh, Bas, from uh, from uh, Denmark. Which yep. variables were more important for the fans on our off pitch? Did you want you to take that at this point or? Yeah, definitely you can uh, answer that. Um, it remains a football industry, so obviously there's there's always uh, on-pitch performance that also uh, helps if fans would renew or not. If the team has been underperforming for a year or maybe uh, more years, there are definitely fans that would drop out. You will see that now with Ajax PSV, for example, this uh, season. Um, there's not really a season ticket product to sell because they don't know when uh, when there can be uh, when games can be played with with fans in the seats again. So the first first ones to drop out now are those ones that actually uh, have the, the the season ticket to watch those games, not for the relationship they have with the club or less with the relationship they have with the club. So uh, on pitch performance works the same way. If there's there's performance goes down, some fans drop out though. Some fans, I would like to emphasize. There's, there's a very, um, there are various layers in fandom, and uh, the bottom layer or the left layer, right layer, whatever. The, there's, there, there are definitely different buckets of fans that behave differently on certain aspects. Uh, some fans say, you know what? Even if we would relegate, I would still go to the games. Fa fascinating. Unfortunately, that's not always the biggest proportion of your fan base. Uh, therefore, you do need to have uh, certain uh, uh, certain aspects controlled. And what you can do, what you can control, that's where you should put your resources on. Okay, thanks. And I, I see uh, a new question coming in from uh, from Ruth. Mm. Is this also applicable to the one on one engagements within, obviously, the personal training field? Um, y yes, it's not a field I'm familiar with, but let me give you an example. Uh, I, were, I have a Fitbit, and if I don't meet my goals, uh, I would like to uh, see from Fitbit, which could personalize that to me personally, saying, hey, you, you've only had three exercises a week where you promised yourself to have four exercises. This is something you can do on Sunday. Um, that could definitely help. And I think also, uh, Ruth, your job is mostly also in the, the actual, um, the offline uh, sphere to communicate with people and to push them through their exercises. You could do that. You could say, okay, I want uh, for, for the clients that you have that haven't been engaging that much uh, with you or have, have, hasn't ha haven't had a meeting with you in two weeks, you could see if MailChimp also does this, shoot out an email to them. Hey, I haven't heard from you in a while. Uh, let's uh, get you uh, back in shape, for example. So there are definitely uh, combinations to make there. Uh, depends a bit on uh, what your approach is to your customers, obviously. Cool. 
Thanks. Uh, yeah. So very interesting cases and examples from fan engagement. This is from Ruben. Uh, something different. Do you have examples of engaging sponsors during this time? Um, yes, I do. There are definitely some sponsors that are uh, taking the opportunity at the moment uh, to put themselves on the forefront. Uh, Avas is one of the examples for AZ, where Avas said, hey, we don't have, um, normally we have a sponsorship where we want the exposure during games. They don't get that. So Avas has approached AZ saying, okay, we want to then do something else uh, with the fans. So what have they done is that they've, uh, they've handed out uh, junior membership packages to 500 young fans. Um, I've tapped into the example of us AC Milan, uh, which had uh, had grouped a couple of uh, their partners, which was I think uh, San Pellegrino, and they had um, um, what's it called again the the, the 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 football game cards Panini, uh, and a couple of other uh, couple of other um, of their their sponsors. They've actually combined that, saying, okay, we want to give something extra to the season ticket. Uh, season ticket holders, therefore we create a box with hand sanitizers and uh, tissues and uh, food, all sponsored by these sponsors, giving them a good, um, giving them a bit of a stage as well to, to show their presence. It's, a, it's an act of kindness. And you see that a lot of sponsors are moving into this CSR sphere. Um, and with that, I'm not talking about uh, every brand now having a commercial on TV with a slow piano music and a very dark voice saying, well, it's all dark and very bad time, so we'll get through this together. No, actually, sports allows you to get that one-on-one -on -one relationship rather than just a commercial on TV. So, um, Asa Milan and AZ, those are two examples I could share with you. Uh, I just share with you now. But I have a lot of examples on my Twitter, by the way, Ruben. So if you if we connect there, uh, I can uh, yeah highlight those to you. Yeah, great. It's it's really interesting to see how different clubs are uh, are responding to this current situation and how they use that to you know put themselves on the forefront or actually help their yeah. their fans stay healthy, stay relevant. Yeah. Some some stay quiet and they they take a bit of a passive uh, attitude, see, uh, seeing what's going to go, what's going to happen. And some clubs or some sponsors even, they get a more active role. This is a uh, nice example by uh, uh, Team Jumbo Visma, where they've, they've had a sort of a, vi a virtual, uh, virtual course they were riding uh, last week. Uh, Formula One still has some virtual, um, uh, virtual content uh, where they've had the, the, the race in, in Albert Park Lake, for example. Uh, they've broadcasted, uh, or they've 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 driven it virtually, which is again also another moment where sponsors can jump in. So uh, sports entities, and that's what makes sports sponsorships so interesting. Sports entities are are a vehicle to uh, have different forms of brand communication as a sponsor to to the fans. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Buzz. Ah, we see one more coming up, I wanted to say. Time to close off, but let's uh, take this and then if there are more questions, type them up now, otherwise we will uh, we'll slowly uh, cheers to the weekend. Or um, shoot them on Twitter or LinkedIn. I can always I, uh, continue with there, so yeah, that's not a problem definitely. either. No. Uh, all right, let's see. What do you think about engaging fans in environmentally sustainable initiatives? Do you have examples of an environmentally driven club that has been successful at it, at this? Mm. Ooh, it's a different, different beast, different, uh, difficult one. Because um, if you think about it, every home game, uh, at least 15, 20, 30, 50,000 people need to travel to a match, uh, to a venue, to a certain location to get to, uh, to, to go see the game. So that's not sustainable at all. Though what you see um, is that I've been uh, last year, uh, when we were still allowed to travel, uh, I went to a Lord's Cricket Ground. And they definitely had a very good sustainability program. Um, where uh, they had, for example, a reusable cups, uh, where instead of always having these plastic cups that you throw on the floor, they had a reusable cup system. 
where um, people actually start to clean up at the end of the event, start to clean up all the cups from the floor because they were all worth one do- one pound. Uh, and in that way, you could see that uh, there was no plastic waste. Uh, plastic is, of course, a big problem. We have different worries now, but as soon as the corona is over, we'll get back to the plastic debate. Um, big problem, and therefore they had reusable cups. Not only were they biodegradable, but also uh, reusable, and you could hand them back into the stadium, and you would get a pound for every uh, cup that you uh, that you collect. We've seen this from festivals now being applied to sports. Well, and and then boss, continuing on that one. Um, do you think that what with the sport clubs now having to somewhat reinvent how they engage with the fans mm-hmm. with no matches going on do you think that will continue after covid 19 that we might actually uh-huh. travel less to the stadiums and you know have this immersive experience at home as if we are sitting in the stadium i wish i could say yes but i'm afraid not uh, i think that um in the end uh bringing uh, butts to seats, as how they call it uh, in, in sports. <laughs> is, is, that's that's a, big, a nice expression. Uh, yeah, bringing butts to seats is a big ge- revenue generator. So um, that will always remain important. And I'm afraid uh, that uh, that will remain for the majority clubs, that will remain the priority. How yeah. can we sell as many tickets as possible uh, for the games? Because that, yeah, at the end, that delivers money, uh, not only for the tickets, but also for the mer- piece of merchandising that they might sell uh, next to that, or the couple of beers that they sell as well. Um, but for the bigger clubs, this might be an eye opener. Uh, I saw that uh, Benjamin, unfortunately, already left the uh, left the chat, but uh, he works at Bayern Munich. They don't have problems uh, filling up their stadium. Uh, so for them, engaging in a digital sphere is far more relevant because those con- connections are not only important for them uh, as, as improving their fan base, but there's also a massive commercial value from having as many relationships as possible. So um, those clubs will definitely continue their digital work. Um, the smaller clubs like AZ I'm afraid they will still be great, but it will still all be focused on getting, in the end, getting as many fans to the stadium as possible. Yeah. As so many I wish, butts to seats as possible. Yes, butts to seats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. Oh, just a hot from the press by uh, by Nick. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Not, so uh, uh, it's not the champion, but we'll play Champions League. There'll be no promotions. Interesting. It's a uh, tough, tough times for football. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Nick, uh, for for uh, that uh, real life uh, li- <laughs> uh, <laughs> remark on uh, on the Dutch competition. Um, I see no uh, no new questions coming in. Uh, and uh, a few of the people already saying goodbye and, uh, and leaving for the weekend. Um, so do follow uh, Boss on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, I will make sure that the, his uh, handles are in the thank you email we will send out uh, uh, somewhere during next week. Uh, thank you all for participating for the questions. Uh, that makes these virtual sessions uh, interactive as possible. So really appreciate that. And of course, uh, thank you, Boss, for... Uh, being our last stop for the weekend with this interesting story about how we can use data to uh, increase our fan engagement. Really appreciate it, you being here. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me and thanks everyone for uh, yeah, participating. No. Thank you.